I would like to warmly welcome all of you to today's luncheon with the Honorable Lisa Jackson, someone we are proud to know as a graduate alum, having earned her master's degree in chemical engineering from Princeton in 1986. Welcome, Lisa. I want to thank Cynthia Cherry, Nan Cohan, Shirley Tillman, and Bob Durkee, and the many students who are with us this morning for their inspiring remarks. As a woman, a minority, and a graduate alum, I'm particularly happy for Bob Durkee to have the experience of being a member of the minority. <laughs> Unfortunately, the lesson is lost on him because he actually enjoys it. I would like to now invite Professor Emily Carter, an eminent physical science chemist and founding director of the Andlinger Center for Energy, the Gerhard R. Andlinger Professor in Energy and the Environment, and Princeton's Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and Applied and Computational Mathematics, to come forward to introduce our keynote speaker this afternoon. As you will see in your program, Professor Carter will be giving a lecture herself immediately following this lunch on moving the planet to green energy, where she will talk about her fascinating current research focusing on the discovery and design of materials for sustainable energy. Like Lisa Jackson, and in the more eloquent words of Shirley Tillman, Professor Carter is a highly accomplished scientist who cares passionately about not only addressing the interlocking energy and environmental challenges that face us, but also training and inspiring the next generation of leaders in this field. She has taught at Princeton since 2004, and her scholarly work has been recognized by numerous honors, including election in 2008 to both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences, and in 2009 to the International Academy of Quantum Molecular Science. It is awe-inspiring to have these two amazing women in the same place, both committed to making real progress on creating a clean energy future and bridging fundamental science with practical applications. Thank you, Professor Carter, for being with us today, both at lunch and immediately following, and helping us introduce the Honorable Lisa Jackson. Well, thank you very much for that way too kind introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. I, I have to apologize, I'm not an alumna. An alumna. I, I graduated from another unnamed university. Um, but I am very pleased to be here uh, to participate in She Roars, a celebration of 40 years of Princeton undergraduate and graduate alumni. I just have to say parenthetically that uh, would that we were celebrating 100 years, but that's another conversation. I am especially pleased to introduce Lisa Jackson, whose life's work is close to my heart as a sister advocate for our environmental future. As we just heard, Lisa is a 1986 graduate alumna in chemical engineering and currently as we all know, the administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. What an incredibly important job you have, <laughs> especially in these days when we are so concerned about so many ongoing problems, from the safety of nuclear reactors to the implications of natural gas hydrofracturing to the ongoing challenges of ensuring clean water and many, many other problems. Lisa is passionate about the interconnection between human health and environmental protection. And she is doing everything she can to work constructively so that environmental protection and sustainability is a win-win for all sectors of society, a win-win also economically. As a Princeton-trained engineer, Lisa has shown wonderfully strong and courageous leadership at the EPA working hard to ensure that the EPA's evaluations and regulations are based on the highest quality science, not science fiction. And I am particularly proud that a Princeton alumna 
has been the first EPA administrator to put in place regulations of greenhouse gases. <laughs> to safeguard our planet for our children and beyond, the profound effect of this act of your leadership will be felt for generations to come and we will all be incredibly thankful to you. Before becoming EPA's administrator, Lisa spent time as a Princeton neighbor, as the chief of staff to New Jersey Governor Corzine, and as commissioner of New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection. So she was doing what she could to make New Jersey better this way as well. She was named one of Essence Magazine's 40 women who have influenced the world, designated as one of Newsweek's most important people in 2010, enlisted for the past two years as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. So please join me in welcoming our truly distinguished speaker, Lisa Jackson, as she roars. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. What a lovely introduction. And um, I, you know, part of the reason for being here was to get a few minutes to talk to you. And um, as you set up the Andlinger Center, I, I see great things for this university and also for a legacy in energy and environment um, that I bet is here today. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I also, of course, want to uh, honor President Tillman, who's here, uh, such an extraordinary leader and such a great idea. Thank you for doing this. And to Rosalie, thank you as well for having me. Now, I just want to begin. I never, I have to do this. This is a unique positioning because I wore the wrong dress for this very breezy day. So there's a lot of roaring I want to do, but I'm going to do it with my hands like this. Um, and we're going to have fun. Um, <laughs> And we're going to start uh, today with just a couple of things. I rarely dedicate things I say or speeches I give. It's not even written here. But I do want to, as, as we gather here for this inaugural event, such power, such, um, such wonderment in this tent for me right now, um, acknowledge a few women who um, made sure I got through school. And I bet for every one of you, there are people like that. And um, they're oftentimes professors, but they might not be. I had breakfast with one of them this morning. Some of you might know Wardell Robinson Moore, who for many years was an associate dean at the Woodrow Wilson School. But what Wardell, she's now at the Blairstown Center. Oh, OK. So you think that will help? I guarantee it's great. It's an engineering solution. <laughs> you think? Yeah? I'm, uh, yeah? All right. If this doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, uh, Wardell was the associate dean at the, at the Woodrow Wilson School. I was not a student at the Woodrow Wilson School, but I ate many a dinner in her home. I washed my clothes oftentimes there. I, did it under the guise of helping her take care of her kids or uh, her puppies at the time. And so, but she got me through school. She literally got me through school. I don't think she's here. Um, I know she's not here. She's heading up to Syracuse to see her son play lacrosse this evening. But I, I have to honor what she did for me. My roommate is here, Pam Scott, uh, got me through school. <laughs> A dear friend of mine, Sharina Walker, is here as well. Thank you for coming. And then there are the people like Pam Tucker, who I don't know if any of you know, who got me through school. Pam was working in housing at the time and made sure that back then, uh, in a community that wasn't as welcoming for people of color as it should have been all the time, that you had a place to live. Those are the things that happened um, and that I think we need to acknowledge as we begin and, and 
feel like we are now at the place where we can make, uh, no matter what your experience was at Princeton, a comforting home that allows us women to roar. And we certainly should be able to do that. I think the uh, turnout is evidence that we're ready, more than ready for that. Now I'm proud to be with you. I want to do one other thing before I move into my prepared remarks, and that's just by show of hands. Um, broadly, broadly, broadly defined, how many of you feel that your life's work, your career, um, is uh, in some way related to the environment, sustainability, making our planet better, making people healthier, betterment. How about betterment? <laughs> All right, well, nobody wants to say their career is not about betterment, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm for pollution. <laughs> All right, well, I'll tell you why I asked that question. It was a couple of conversations, and someone just suggested I ask you, um, but it's part of my speech here today. Now, I'm really proud to be here and to join you in marking this milestone. It's an honor to be part of this celebration with women like Andrea Jung and Wendy Kopp and Justice Sonia Sotomayor, all of whom are out there making Princeton proud, certainly, each and every day, and, of course, who we are so proud of. Let me also extend to you the warm regards of President Obama when you consider the fact that <laughs> when you consider the fact that he chose me to head the EPA and has chosen not only Justice Sotomayor but Elena Kagan as our newest members of the Supreme Court. I guess there's some evidence that the president recognizes the extraordinary potential of Princeton women. <laughs> oh, wait, I forgot. <laughs> he clearly understands the importance and potential of Princeton women. He is married to one, our amazing first lady, Michelle Robinson. You can't help but walk on this campus whenever you come back and just marvel at the change. Princeton's always been known for change. It's architecture, the symbol. You know, when I come back, I always start with an architectural tour as I remember it because there's always a new building and to be able to march through time at Princeton through architecture is one of the treats of being on this campus. But there's all kind of change in the room today. Year after year, this university has progressed, and it has been an amazing progression in a short amount of time. This amazing um, struggle for rights and respect and equality for the women of this country and this university. Um, you've taken on one of the great challenges of our time, and now you lead in it. I don't just mean, by the way, uh, this university working on itself. That's important. But obviously, turning out women leaders who make it into the history books. We owe a great deal to their struggles and to their work. But we also owe a great deal to the quiet struggles of mothers and daughters over many years. For example, a month ago I was speaking at an EPA Women's History Month event and I said a few words about a powerful woman who helped make history, Geraldine Ferraro, who passed away earlier that week. When she passed away, one of the remembrances of her in the newspaper noted that Geraldine was raised by a single mother. Her mother had taken jobs like uh, crocheting beads on wedding dresses to raise the money to send her daughter to good schools and give her a better future. Geraldine Farrar's life and her work helped expand the equality and opportunity that are the great promises of our country. She inspired young girls and women across the country to reach higher but I'm struck by the fact that the determination it took for her to do what she did came from the unsung determination of a mother who made sure her daughter would have the opportunity to succeed. And I bet we also have examples of that in our own lives as well. Now today I'm privileged to work with a number of brilliant women, scientists and policymakers and leaders who do extraordinary work at EPA to build the best health and environmental protections for the American people. One of those brilliant women is Lisa Heinzerling, another Princeton woman who spent two years with us at EPA. Yeah, she's back at Georgetown Law now. And when we talk about being able to be the first administration to recognize that greenhouse gases are endangering our public health and welfare, it was 
Massachusetts versus EPA, a case that Lisa worked intimately on um, that set us on the course of being able to begin that critical work on, to fight climate change. I'm proud to call all of the women at EPA my colleagues and to be working by their side as we continue the long legacy of environmental and health leadership from women. Women like Rosalie Edge, who reinvigorated the ideas of environmental conservation in the early 1930s. It was by standing on the shoulders of women like Rosalie Edge that others like Sylvia Earle and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and Jane Goodall were able to emerge as leading advocates for protecting our health and our planet. Another woman, another woman scientist, I should say, Rachel Carson, was a transformative figure in the work we, so many of you do. Her book, Silent Spring, changed environmentalism forever, launching the modern day movement. I actually don't think it's a coincidence her bu book was published in the early 1960s. By 1970s, 1970, we had an EPA and a Clean Water Act and a Clean Air Act. We had a federal agency dedicated in a beautiful building, come visit, um, and we have a beautiful room in that building uh, called the Rachel Carson Green Room in her honor. Now I started my career at EPA as a staff science back, scientist back in 1987. That was a time when you still didn't see a lot of women working and studying in the environmental engineering field. When I received my master's degree here from Princeton, um, I was one of only two women in my class that year. According to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, around 154,000 women were pursuing master's degrees in science and engineering back when I was in school. By 2003, that number jumped to around 270,000. <laughs> 50 years ago, when the first woman got accepted to Princeton, women earned less than 10% of the science and engineering doctorates awarded in the U.S. But good news, by 2006, that number climbed to 40%. So I'm glad to be back here and see Princeton leading ch the charge in that progress as well. Yesterday I gave a lecture hosted by the Graduate Engineering Council and had the privilege to be joined on stage by two of the many women who I acknowledged in the talk, many women in the room who are studying in engineering fields. And of course it's not just attendance from female scientists that have increased. We now have an incredible woman, Professor Emily Carter, who is heading up the Andlinger Center for Energy and Environment and preparing the environmental scientists to think about the future. And to go from graduating in a class of just two women scientists to coming back and seeing that the president of the university, the first female president, is also a scientist is really something special as well. So my congratulations to President Tillman, and I know that we're all excited to see where her leadership is taking this wonderful institution. Now, a couple other points. I started college wanting to be a doctor. My father passed away from a heart attack when I was in high school. I had an uncle whose asthma was so severe that he had to move away from his home and his family in Louisiana to Phoenix, Arizona, just so he could breathe. Nowadays, by the way, Phoenix is not a place you would go to do that. <laughs> yes, we still have a little work to do at the EPA. I had a brother with asthma. I have a son with asthma, actually, too. I felt, as many women often do, a call to service. I think that was the heart of my wanting to be a doctor, a call to issues of health, to using my degree to make a difference in the world around me. I also loved math. I loved science. In addition to pre-med, I took a few engineering courses on the side. And I studied how chemicals in our air and our water and our land and from there entered in our bodies then affect our health. And if they don't affect our health directly, they affect the environment in which we live. When I was studying to be a doctor to help people when they got sick, I came to realize that if I studied engineering and started working to protect our environment, I could also help people by making sure they didn't get sick in the first place. See, we do prevention. We prevent debilitating conditions like heart disease and asthma and cancer. I can help make sure that when you put your kids on the bus to school, they aren't breathing in lead and soot. That can cause serious and lasting damage to their health. Or when you pour a glass of water or take your family on a vacation to the beach, the water's safe to drink and swim in. So those kinds of issues are what brought me to environmental protection. At EPA, I worked my way up the ranks in the big old federal bureaucracy, and it took me time 
And in that time, it, I witnessed firsthand the changes that took place and the doors that opened, not just for me, but to all women. It's why I'm able to be with you today. It's why I have the chance to work with the many amazing women cabinet members and the growing number of women leading the way in Congress and public service and business and education. It's also given me an extraordinary front row seat to history, to achievements happening in the field of sustainability and the environment and energy all over the world. I recently traveled to Brazil with the president where we met with Jilma Rousseff, that nation's first ever female president, and we talked um, about working together on sustainability initiatives. I just got back from a trip to Africa a few months ago and I saw women leaders in Kenya, um, like Wangari Maathai, but not only Wangari Maathai, working to reforest the country at threat of their lives, working to empower more women to step into roles protecting the environment and the health of communities. I've had the great privilege of working with our Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, on a global alliance for clean cooking stoves. This is an effort through the UN Foundation to support cleaner options for the hundreds of millions of families that get their food from a cooking stove all over the world. Making that single change of giving them a cleaner source of fuel and a more efficient stove, something that might cost 10, 20, 30 dollars, will address a health threat that falls disproportionately on women and the children who sit next to them while they cook dinner around the world, causing premature deaths and illness. Then I traveled to Ethiopia and had the great honor of meeting with the first female professor at Addis Ababa University. I spoke with her and some of her female colleagues who helped establish the Ethiopian Academy of Sciences. So let me close on that point, maybe two. While I was speaking to the panel of women scientists, someone asked me, why is it when we talk about the environment, we always seem to w use war metaphors like fight and defend? Why do we do that? And I thought about it for a while, but my answer remains the same. I don't think we're at the point yet where we don't have to, but I do hope we move in that direction. My answer to her was that in a modern world, in a modern economy, clean air and clean water don't happen by accident. It takes vigilance and work to make sure that those fundamental things are protected and passed down to the next generation. And we are not yet at the point where we can move beyond having to fight to ensure that we don't lose the protections of air and water that are so important to ensuring that we do prevent illness, that we do take care of the next generation. But I also want you to remember the question I asked you earlier. So many of you who feel like you're involved in some way in bettering human health or bettering this planet or maybe moving to a new paradigm like sustainability that has the potential to transform the way we live and our children and their children exist on this globe. And I always am struck by the fact that it's women who do it. It's women who do that work disproportionately, whether it's at the EPA where we uh, in most years have more women uh, uh, scientists than men scientists on staff or whether I, um, uh, as I was just talking to the president, come to find out, and to Emily, that when you look at the green, sustainable groups on any campus, they tend to be disproportionately populated by young women and by female professors who mentor them. Why is that? Well, it's because it's our bodies that bear the burden of pollution. Men do too, but our bodies are polluted. And it didn't get, that pollution doesn't get there by accident. It's what you breathe and where you, uh, and what you eat. And that pollution ends up in our breast milk. <laughs> and that breast milk ends up in our babies. So we have a physical connection to the next generation, to understanding what it means to see um, health effects caused by pollution, by unclean air, unclean water, by food that's not safe and healthy for us. And I think that motivates us on a very fundamental level. I think it's a connection we share. Why is that important? Because I think all of us in getting together at gatherings like this need to find common ground. It doesn't have to be the ground that I exist or that Emily's life uh, career calls her to but we have to find it because we need to. We're at that point where I think we need to have our power multiplied 
by others who sit and feel the same way we do about issues. We need to take this safe place and turn it into a really powerful and empowering place for all of us to be. Because that's really the story of women's history, the fact that we do engineering differently to some degree. We approach it differently to some degree. The women before us secured fundamental rights like the right to vote and equal access to education, but it still means that we have to fight just like for a clean environment to ensure we get our due to secure the fundamental right for example, for equal pay, for equal work that this administration secured. It makes me very proud that the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was the first bill, the very first bill that President Obama signed into law. But it, <laughs> it was also a reminder that we have to keep working and fighting. As individuals, all of us are here and feels as diverse as you could imagine the ones we've chosen to enter into, but we do have things in common. We need to find them and outline where they are. And the aspiration to test the limits to go beyond where people think we can be is probably one of the first things we all have in common. That's something that brought us here to this extraordinary institution. It's up to us to pass it on. Nothing will inspire the next generation of women leaders like the example of this generation, and we set that example. So I'm glad to be here. I'm actually quite honored to be here to speak to each and every one of you and, um, and empower you <laughs> to confront those things that you decide are really important to us. Thanks. We only have time for just a couple questions. Yes. Here we go. One second. Here we go. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I had the pleasure of hearing you speak about a year ago at a very hopeful moment when Waxman Markey had passed Congress and the Senate had not yet failed to pass cap and trade. And I asked you at that time what the EPA would do if we didn't get cap and trade. And you decided to play your cards close to the chest <laughs> <laughs> appropriately. So I'd love to ask that question again, if you can talk a little bit about what can be done. Absolutely. A little bit of background for um, those of you who are like, what is, what is she talking about? Um, <laughs> so you heard about uh, greenhouse gas uh, pollution and the fact that this EPA under this administration is using the Clean Air Act, which is a 40-year-old law in our country. Uh, it's responsible for uh, huge uh, decreases in air pollution, although we still have work to do in that regard. But we can use the Clean Air Act, or so the Supreme Court has told us in a 2007 ruling, the one Lisa Heinzeling worked on, to address greenhouse gas pollution. And back when we spoke about a year ago, um, I joined the president in calling for legislation specifically designed to deal with carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. Why? Because carbon dioxide is emitted at much higher levels than most pollution you would think about. Skeptics like to point out, well, you breathe out carbon dioxide all the time. Yes, you do, but the big breathe outers are power plants and our cars. They exhale a lot more um, uh, uh, greenhouse gases and CO2. Any combustion, any time you burn a fossil fuel, you get amounts of CO2, some more than others. Um, and so because of that, the Clean Air Act is a tool that can be used to address greenhouse gases, and that is what we are doing. So most Americans don't know in all the sort of hullabaloo uh, that they might hear that we right now in this country regulate greenhouse gas emissions. We've done it, we do it using the Clean Air Act for automobiles. Many of you have heard that automobiles are getting much cleaner. Time magazine called 2010 the year of the electric car. We don't mandate electric cars in this country, but we mandate two things. Fuel economy, which is increasing uh, faster than I think most would have expected it to, thanks to uh, the clean car deal that the president brokered early in the administration. But also, we regulate the greenhouse gas emissions from cars, which uh, moves cars to be more efficient in, in the fuel they burn and also affects things like the refrigerants in cars, which are also can be potent greenhouse gases as well. 
So we regulate cars. We now, as of January of this year, use the Clean Air Act um, um, to uh, regulate large stationary sources, power plants primarily, and really large facilities um, that emit uh, the most greenhouse gases. If you look at greenhouse gases in our country, it's transportation sector, the utility sector, uh, and then everything, uh, then refineries, then everything else. So those are, we're sort of attacking the biggest sources and we're making what I would say are modest steps. We are not, there are no, uh, you know, game changing solutions because right now we're waiting for all these wonderful scientists and engineers to come up with a game changer that moves us to be able to quickly see large reductions. Um, and there's lots of work and lots of uh, resources being put into all kinds of great ideas on capturing carbon uh, and finding uh, efficiencies. What we do to regulate carbon dioxide right now is do exactly what we did for cars. We're moving industry to be much more efficient in how they use fossil fuels. And in that efficiency, you actually can see pretty dramatic uh, reductions in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So we will continue that. Uh, and um, and we intend to continue it. And uh, you know, politically, we are fighting to continue to have the authority uh, under the Clean Air Act to regulate greenhouse gases and to continue to make a series of modest steps that will not change the game, but will get this country started in dealing with this um, uh, huge threat to our planet, and will hopefully set the stage for Congress to act in the future. Anybody over? Uh, oh, we got a microphone here. Along a similar vein, could you discuss um, fracking? Sure. <laughs> you guys are all environmentalists today. <laughs> um, hydraulic fracking. So for those of you who are like, what the frack is she talking about? <laughs> How many? Go ahead. Raise your hand. Um, um, I think, uh, so, uh, you know, one of the things that has the potential to move us along in reducing greenhouse gases is use of natural gas as a source of um, uh, fuel to, uh, co to generate energy. Natural gas for scientists and engineers is the feedstock for many, many chemicals, synthetic chemicals that we make. But if you have enough natural gas, you can use it in place of other fossil fuels, like coal, for example, and it has a much lower carbon footprint. It emits less CO2 per kilowatt uh, or megawatt of, uh, of energy. So um, it's, a, it's a good fuel. It's better. How about that? It's better than some of the other options out there from that standpoint. And there's one other reason it's a good fuel. We just found out we have a lot more of it in this country than we ever knew we had, but it's caught up in um, shale, in very tight formations, very deep in the ground. Um, and you probably know, if you live in this area, that one of those formations is called the Marcellus Shale, and it extends up through Pennsylvania and New York and down into parts of West Virginia and maybe a little into Virginia. Um, so there is a rush to uh, develop and get that natural gas. If you can get it, it keeps the price down. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to very quickly see real reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. The issue is to get it in those tight formations, you have to break those formations up so the gas can come out of the well. You drill a well, and but now the gas is stuck in the rock, so you fracture the rock, and the way you do that is that you send down the, the well large, large amounts of water, and you um, basically have a little explosion down there, and that fluid goes in and opens up the pores of the rock, and then you draw it all back out, and with it comes the natural gas. <clears throat> and there are concerns, I think valid concerns, about the safety of that process on drinking water and on water resources. And let me say just a couple of things about fracking before I answer your question. I know it's a long answer. First, it has been used a long, long time in this country in oil and gas development. In fact, in, as an undergraduate, that was one of the things I think I did in a summer job maybe somewhere. Um, the difference is that we're using it a lot more because these are tighter formations and we're using it in places that are very populated, in watersheds where unlike parts of the uh, West, say Wyoming, 
you know, there are a lot more people for, per square mile. So drinking water impacts and water impacts can have huge impacts on public health and on the ecology. So you have to do it safely. The president's done several things. Most recently, he made a speech at Georgetown where he outlined his energy blueprint, and he called on um, the Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu, and myself, and the head of the Department of Interior to come together, put together a panel of people who uh, in 90 days, we now have 60 days, will make some suggestions on best practices to make sure fracking is done with an eye towards minimizing any safety or environmental threats, and then to, in 180 days, put together a set of recommendations on making that process safer as well. In addition, EPA has some regulatory authority, which we are using to enforce and require um, uh, good practices where we can, but often, and certainly in one of the biggest, uh, uh, most publicized concerns, which is what chemicals do you put in the ground in order to frack a well, EPA does not have authority because uh, the, uh, the process of injecting that fluid into the ground is exempt from the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, and so there is, um, <laughs> in, yes, and those, you can tell there are people who are into this issue, in an exemption given several years ago in the last administration, commonly called the Halliburton exemption. <laughs> um, so as you might imagine, there are some uh, people who would like very much to see those exemptions go away. This administration has called for disclosure of what are in flac fracking fluids. Uh, we at EPA are doing our job to regulate the water that uh, comes back out the hole because that is clearly regulated. We're about to put out guidelines for diesel uh, in the next several weeks, I would probably say more like a couple months. Uh, and then we are working on um, air impacts from fracking because if you're leaking a whole bunch of natural gas into the atmosphere, natural gas is actually a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. Uh, and so you wouldn't want to do that if you're really trying to minimize CO2. Um, so those are all issues that uh, have to be addressed. But let me end by saying I believe they can be addressed. It will be scientists and engineers and innovation and an insistence that people do fracking correctly. Um, one more quick one? Or, oh, I have to go. Hi. Thank you, Lisa, for a wonderful talk. We clearly need more scientists, administrators in our government to explain all these things to us. <laughs> <laughs> you are a role model for so many of us, and we thank you for taking on the often thankless job of an agency head in today's political and economic climate. Some of you may not know that the Washington Post last month reported that Lisa had received seven grillings on Capitol Hill about environmental regulations in the first two weeks of March alone, more than any other federal agency director has faced. <laughs> so I just wanted to relay one anecdote before she leaves. At one hearing of the House Subcommittee on Energy and Power and the Subcommittee on Environment and the Economy, the congressperson, who I won't name, turned to the topic of mercury <laughs> He criticized Lisa for saying that plants emit tons and tons of it and told her to, of carbon and told her to check her facts on that, asserting that it's not tons a year but pounds. <laughs> yes, Lisa agreed it was pounds. 2,000 pounds equals a ton. <laughs> She said this finally after her stoic um, face during the whole testimony. She finally cracked a smile, and that brought a smile to my face, too, as I see all of you, and wish I could have been there to say, you go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> so on behalf of Princeton and the Alumni Council, thank you so much. Thank you.